Hey guys, Crystal here. As some of you know, I've been doing long distance races for almost 17 years now. During that time, I've seen a lot of changes and learned a lot. That's why I'm grateful for having discovered Sword Energy Drink. Previously, like most endurance runners, I carried my hydration and fuel separately. And also because I am a very salty sweater, I would have to carry separate electrolytes or salt pills. Now, with Sword, I'm able to get everything in one simple product that contains only six natural ingredients. Recently, I did the math on what I used to take in during a typical marathon and was floored to discover that I was putting in over 30 different ingredients into my body. So, if you're looking to simplify your nutrition strategy, I would strongly encourage you to check out the information that's available at drinksword.com. If you decide you want to test it out for yourself, be sure to use the discount code HEARTLANDRUNNER to save 20%. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. Join Crystal, Andy, and Stephen as they explore all things running related in the Heartland and beyond. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. I'm Crystal. And I'm Stephen. I'm Andy. And that's Ah! and that's it. Oh, we already screwed up. But it's nice to have Andy back. He has been absent for a couple episodes. For a lot of people, it's going to seem like he was absent for a while. But in reality, he was only absent for two nights. (laughs) So welcome back to the show, Mr. Andy. Thank you for having me back on the show (laughs) and not barring me. (laughs) (laughs) Now, how's, How's the baseball team doing? Baseball team is doing great, and so they are. Uh, they've lost one game, but they've won three, and so we're going to try to make it four games tomorrow night. It's a good team. But Andy, since you, since you missed a couple episodes, I'm going to have to reduce your pay by fifty percent. Oh wow! <laughs> That's I'm not going to be able to survive. So, anyways, Miss Crystal, who's joining yes. us tonight? Um, did you guys know that the other day? I don't know if you caught this or not. That it was ride your bike to work day. I missed that one. Yeah, so, you know, somehow somehow that just wasn't on my radar either. The reason why I happened to catch it, though, was I was on Instagram. No shock there. And I happened to come across um, this Ride Your Bike to Work Day. And it was actually posted by Dean Carnassus, who, you know, you wouldn't expect for Ride Your Bike to Work Day because, of course, he's ultra marathon man. And uh, but he did it in a little bit of Dean style. So it was not riding your Schwinn or your Trek to the accounting office. His office was, he was standing in front of the big Death Valley sign, which of course is the start line to Badwater uh, 135, which we just talked to Harvey Lewis about. And instead of his Trek bike, he had a nice elliptigo. And of course, I was reading through the comments and stuff, and everybody was absolutely fascinated by this elliptigo. That and his calves, those were the two common, common themes in there. A lot of people have probably seen elliptigo if you followed some some of the uh, elite runners online and stuff but may not have heard the name and i am not even going to try and describe it because i will not do justice so our guest host tonight is actually the co-founder and the ceo of elliptigo and it's brian pate welcome brian hey happy to be on the show hey well, we're glad you joined us i think we've got uh, a lot of questions for you i know i've i've seen uh, your videos and uh, I haven't seen any around here, but I don't even see many bicycles where I live. So <laughs> kind of out in the country. So I am interested to find out more because I have cool. been in the market for a a bike or something else to do some cross training with. So I'm not always beating my feet every day. Good. Yeah, no, that's exactly why we why the Elliptico exists. So uh, happy to chat about it. Do you actually call it a bike? We do. Yeah, it's, we call it an elliptical bike. And we think of it as a category of bicycle, but the inspiration for it and the purpose of it is very running centric. So it's really a tool designed specifically for runners to emulate the running experience just without the impact. Now, you you came up with this, uh, I, I believe I read because you um, basically you couldn't stand the elliptical machines inside of a gym. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a few things I couldn't stand. Uh, and some frustrations. I uh, am a former runner. So I started running, gosh, um, before high school, uh, training for soccer when I was a kid, and then actually ran track in high school um, one season, but was more of a kind of a distance guy. And I was a Marine. And so got into sort of distance running the Marine Corps, you know, ran a marathon, did an Ironman triathlon. So um, got into the distance running um community 
And, uh, but by the time I was 32, I had done so much running that my body couldn't take it anymore. And so the purpose of the elliptigo was to solve my frustration with that situation that I did not anticipate, which is what do you do if you can't run? You, you built the bike around it, right? Because yes. you, you couldn't stand sitting inside of a gym, looking out a window. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you can't, I did a lot of triathlon and uh, never enjoyed the bike seat in particular, and also felt like cycling took too long. And so I ended up going to the gym and doing the elliptical trainer when I sort of lost the ability to run for exercise. And I found that the elliptical trainer motion was okay in the sense that it allowed me to get in a really good workout, but I dreaded going to the gym. I hated getting in my car to go work out. I mean, that just seems absurd to me. And I really miss just kind of the pure simplicity and joy of walking outside the door and heading off on my exercise. Getting all the fresh air and the... Yeah, and the thinking, like there's a whole mental element of running that I really benefited from that was very lost to me going to the gym. Like I hated walking into the gym and having to like swipe in my card and then see is my elliptical machine open or not. And then go over if it's wait for somebody. It was just it's such a process. You know, there's such a purity to running uh, as being so simple. And then the elliptigo, you know, adds a level of complexity with the equipment. But it's still like this morning I got up and opened up the garage and went out on my ride. How did like the prototype process go? Did you, you know, just get some tubes and chains and gears <laughs> and start, start yeah. welding them together and go, hmm, I think I got something? It was funny. So um, I have no capabilities whatsoever when it comes to mechanical engineering, but I was luckily, lucky enough to have worked with a pretty talented engineer and also trained for uh, Ironman triathlon with him while we were at a semiconductor company. And uh, he went on to become a pretty accomplished ultra marathoner, won an ultra marathon as, you know, has a couple of belt buckles from the Angeles Crest and some other uh, pretty tough races. And so anyway, when I thought of this idea, I called him up and uh, he immediately said like, yes, I could build you an outdoor elliptical bike, but I'm sure it already exists. And so it was a funny process of convincing ourselves that no one had done this before. And then it was literally like, buying tubes from the steel tube provider and finding random bike parts on eBay is how we cobbled together the very first, um, the, you know, cutting skateboard wheels in, in half and, and all sorts of, of, uh, of stuff like that to create the first prototype. So then uh, you, you got your prototype done. And then uh, I imagine that you went to a production ready uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of bike. How, how long ago was that, uh, that you had your first yeah. production? model out. Yeah, no, we started in 2005. And so it took us about a year to design the first prototype, just after work and before work. And then I rode that first prototype for maybe six months in 2006. And then we built a second generation prototype. And I rode that one for about a year and did a 50 mile um, cycling event on it. And it was, took me like three hours and 15 minutes. It felt exactly like a marathon. And that was really when we knew, like, this thing is for real. And then we did two more prototype generations before we actually took it into production. So, so since you've gone to market uh, from that from that first model, uh, what sort of changes has has there been done to to improve it or uh, or different looks or what have you done with the bike? Yeah, great question. So we ended up expanding the first product into three products, really based on the number of gears that they have. So one's designed for kind of flat lands. One is what we call sort of the best bang for your buck. That's the one that Dean and Meb and, and myself and most people ride. And then um, the highest end model is our 11 speed model. It has carbon fiber and it's kind of for the super enthusiast. And then um, that fundamental experience, though, has stayed true to our original uh, concept that we launched um, in 2010. So that what we call the long stride system that's totally focused on running has been fundamentally the same from 2010 until today. And then um, last year, we launched a new family of products uh, that are what we call our compact stride, 
because it turns out there's a somehow there's a lot of people in the world that don't actually want to emulate the running experience, but what? still, yeah, it's right. We were, it took us seven years to get our heads around that, but actually there's a whole population of people out there that don't run. And it turned out they were like 50% of our customers. So we had this weird conundrum where all we were doing was talking about running and talking to runners and half of our customers were not runners. And about 10% of those people would email us and tell us to knock it off with all the running stuff because they hated running and it made them not want to buy our product. So it was pretty funny. So, so you know, we're talking running. We're all runners here. How, how much does the Elliptico uh, actually compare to run specific fitness? Yeah, it's amazing. So we have uh, some universities are now studying that exact question. And there's been at least three studies done now specifically looking at, you know, run training only versus elliptico training only on uh, conditioned runners, typically collegiate runners, and how they perform after four weeks, six weeks, and the longest one was 12 weeks. The results have come back and basically say, which is pretty amazing, they say, look, for uh, four to six weeks, a runner who substitutes all of their run training for elliptico training basically performs the same as if they just if they kept their their run training up for those four to six weeks. It's amazing. So Ohio University has published a couple studies that say that. And then uh, University of Memphis has a similar study. And the, what we're really trying to push, though, is the accretive benefits of it. Because it's no impact, we're really interested to see, can a runner get faster by actually cutting back on their running miles and then adding in these non-impact miles on top of it to do a total inc- an increase in total volume of training, but um, uh, deliver less impact to the body. And so we think that at the end of the day, we think that um, runners are limited by the amount of miles they can run because of the impact forces. And so we're super curious to see what if you kind of take those impact forces away run enough to maintain your running economy, but then add a ton of of low impact cardio work on top of it through the elliptico, will that make you faster? So, you know, something that I I was thinking to myself whenever, you know, I I was looking at the elliptico as as someone who's getting ready to turn 40, I know that I, I might someday have to start backing off on my intensity or maybe not my intensity, but maybe my run days and changing some mm-hmm. things around. And I look at something like the elliptico as maybe something where I can keep as many training days as I get older because I'm putting a little less impact on my body. And so as, as someone who would be getting a, uh, getting a bike like this and saying, I am going to replace this day, this running day with mm-hmm. my elliptico, how would, how would that translate? How would a running workout translate to the elliptico? Would you, how, how would you do that? Yeah, no, it's great. Great question. You would look at it and base it off of time and intensity. So let's say you want to substitute a recovery day and a interval day. So on your recovery day, let's say you were going to do a four mile easy run. You could replace that with actual with a, and let's say that four mile easy run is going to take you 32 minutes. So you could replace that 32 minute run with probably a 40 minute elliptico ride and actually have the same number of kind of heartbeats for your perceived effort, which is one of the way these studies control um, training volume. What some athletes, so so athletes will typically start with that. They'll be like, okay, instead of going out for four, you know, easy miles, I'll go ride my elliptico that day. What they find is they actually end up training a little harder and a little longer than they otherwise would have. And Mm -hmm. their body actually recovers better than it would had they actually done the the, the four mile run with the additional pounding. Because even that four miles run, even if you're going slowly, you still are putting a little bit of pounding on your body. So one thing to do would be, okay, substitute out that uh, recovery run for a quote unquote recovery elliptico ride and use that elliptico ride to be a little more um, aggressive on the training piece because your, your bones and joints are totally recovering. So you can actually work your cardio system a little harder. And then on the interval training, if you're going to do like really quality training, whether it's hill repeats or intervals or, or um, some sort of training like that, uh, you can match one for one. So on time duration. So if you're going to run, say you're going to run 
four eight hundred, four by eight hundred, and three by one mile for a training session. You could go out and let's say you're a you're going to run your eight hundreds at two oh five and your mile at I don't know five minutes. You can go out and run on the elliptico on the track. Go out there and do a two minute and five second sprint with whatever period of recovery you normally do, and you'll get an unbelievable a workout that is equivalent to to doing it running wise from a cardio standpoint and you won't do any wear and tear on your legs and so to your point the 40 year olds that's what we're seeing them doing is is actually substituting out workouts that they would normally do running and doing on the elliptico instead Wow, I'm 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 on my phone here, and I'm just about to to click buy. Uh, <laughs> I'm not 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 there yet, but I'm getting there. Well, hey, I've got just a couple more questions, and I'll quit hogging yeah. the mic from from yeah, the other. Yeah, but hosts. Andy, go go ahead and order but, two. I'll I'll pay you back. Okay, yeah, that's great. Yeah, throw throw in another one there. Okay, three of them. Why not? <laughs> it's only money. Uh, but anyway, uh, one one thing I I see that would just be amazing for someone if you if you were a, a serious runner and you had a race that was coming up that you were very serious about this race and let's say you injure yourself and you need to be low impact uh right in the middle of your training cycle i mean i see i see this as something that could completely salvage someone's marathon and and keep you up and going the way that you described that you know you can keep doing that run specific uh exercise and, and you keep, keep your fitness up I'm, I'm sure that people come to you uh, with injuries. And what are some of the most common injuries that people will specifically buy that elliptico for? Uh, so that way they can salvage their training or keep training. Yeah, the um, a lot of plantar fasciitis. Uh, we see a lot of knee and hip just overuse pain. We'll see actually broken bones, a broken tibia. Um, we've had a broken sacrum. We've had a guy, uh, one of the best, Masters runners out there, this guy named Brian Pilcher. He had a torn labrum, rode the elliptico for, he had a torn labrum, got surgery on it, rode the elliptico for nine months straight, came back and was running faster than before he tore his labrum. Hey, like, hey Brian. Wow. Yeah. If, if Andy were to buy one, you could add an injury to, to the list. And, and that is, and that is a hog broke his toe. So <laughs> I got stepped on by a hog and broke my toe by two weeks hog. before a race. That is my, that is the first hog related boat. What is that? Not bovine, but, uh, I guess swine. pig related. Yeah. There you go. Swine related yeah. running injury. I've heard, but I like it. Yeah. All right. One, one last question here. Uh, can, can you set it up to use it indoors? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we sell, uh, yep. There's like a third of the bike trainers out there. will work with it. You just need typically just need a 20 inch, um, wheel adapter because, uh, our wheel is smaller, but, uh, we sell a couple versions that work fine. There's a bunch of different brands that sell them. So you absolutely, you can do it indoors. Okay, great. Okay. Add three to cart and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, I have, I have, an, I have a question here. I, I just I kind of thought of it. What's the farthest you've ever heard someone riding an elliptico at one time? This will boggle your guys' minds. So, what's your guess? What do you think the the longest single distance effort is? I'm going 300 miles. Okay. Anybody higher or lower? I'll, than I'll that? go five. I'll go five. Okay. I don't know at a single time, but I have seen. I do know that there are people who have ridden across the country on it. But of course, yep. I don't know if we're counting like overnight stays and stuff. So continuous at one time. Uh, I'll split the different. I'll say like 350. Cool. So the uh, current 24 hour record is uh, 321 miles. Oh, uh, I should win 20, something. in 24 hours. <laughs> there's a, a there's a bike event called the Paris Brest Paris, which is 1200 kilometers long. And you have 90 hours to complete it in. And it's run every four years. It's been uh, it's supposedly like the oldest cycling event, continuously run cycling event. It started in the 1800s. And it goes from literally the, Cirrus, the city of Paris, France, out to the coast of France and back. And uh, eight elliptico riders completed it in under the 90-hour cutoff the last time it was run. Wow. Oh, that, that's and amazing. And that's uh, 1,200 kilometers is... 700 something miles. Yeah, that sounds about right. 745 miles. So it's people are crazy. I mean, cr cr crazy. <laughs> but what's cool, like as a runner, I look at that and I say, that's like ludicrous Dean Carnazes type stuff. 
And so for like eight normal sort of, sim, uh, I won't say normal, but for eight people who you would not think would push themselves for 80 plus hours straight to be able to complete it is, is pretty cool. Um, but obviously to the extreme, but what I think is actually neat about it, that's different from running is you do get to get out of your little run circle, so to speak. Like when I was a runner, I had the same three routes that I just ran in conjunction for whatever distance I wanted. I had like a three mile route, a four mile route and a six mile route. And between those three routes, I could basically run any distance. With the Elliptigo, I now go out on like a 30 mile ride that's totally different from any other 30 mile ride I've ever done. And I see like completely different things go to different parts of the of the county that I live in. And it's a very, there's something, I guess, neat about that. I sort of a little bit get cycling in that regard. There's just, uh, there's a sense of freedom that comes with it that I didn't find running quite had for me when I was actually training for running events. Because I guess I'm just, I'll do the same thing over and over and over again. I have a question. Out, out where I live, um, paved roads are are not the normal. <laughs> Okay. So how does the elliptical work on, I mean, they're dirt roads, but they're more hard packed, uh, yeah. know, country road type stuff. They're fine. It, uh, it's not great for like single track, um, mountain biking, mm -hmm. but if you're on a, a graded, any sort of graded road, whether it's dirt or they also have that like cinder, cinder type mm -hmm. road, um, that stuff's totally fine. People have done all, uh, you know, hundreds of miles on that kind of surface. Uh, with no problem. So I'm curious, going back to when you showed up at that 50 mile race, when you still yeah. had a prototype and it, no, uh -huh. nothing like it existed, how were you received at that race? You know what? The lift to go for it, it's been such a treat to experience other people's first reactions to it. And everyone smiles and says, oh my gosh, like, they, there's a joy that is sort of produced by people seeing an elliptico for the first time. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because they like harken back to their days when they used to ride their bike kid. I don't know if they just like seeing something kind of new in the world, but we got a ton of positive comments. I was talking to people the entire three plus hours. There was always someone riding next to me asking me questions, generally the same questions, but asking me questions about, about the bike, which was super fun. And it's funny too, you were talking about, you know, some of the um, studies and stuff. I did a um, indoor marathon in January and it was up at Ohio Northern University. Oh, and, okay. Um, yeah. And it's, so it's really fun. It's run indoor on their two, 200 uh, meter track. So it's 211 laps, something crazy <laughs> like that. But it's fun because it's a, they do it as a fundraiser every year for their track team and for their cross country team. And last year, um, they did it and they raised money to buy elliptigos for the team oh, for the specific okay. reason of supplementing to their training. So yeah, that was kind of one of the, and then it was fun too, because while we were on the track, they had some of the students out running with us and then they had an elliptigo set up on the indoor trainer and one of the students were using it. So it was kind of fun to see it up close like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. We've so had close. a ton, ton of adoption by universities. So we're in between university teams and high school teams, over 150. Um, and I think it's the majority are universities. And they have they see results. In fact, I just got emailed today a video of a high school runner who had been hurt for six months. Um, he came back in his very first race. So this was his very first competitive event, I guess, was this weekend. And his dad sent us the video. And this kid ran the opening 800 meter leg of a four by 800 relay. That was what they were going to have him be his first competition back. And his PR in the 800 last year was a 205 and he ran a 159. Ooh. It was crazy. The other kids weren't even in the frame of the video for almost the entire second lap. And his dad was like so overjoyed because they were so nervous that he was going to come back and run like a 210. Um, so that's just one of a zillion stories like that, where these kids, if you can keep them training while they're injured, it's incredible how fast they come back. So I'm curious, how did you um, get connected up with some of the elite, elite runners that you're associated with? So, you know, Meb and um, I saw Jared Ward. Um, yep. Clearly, Dean Carnass. There's, there's a lot. There was a lot more as I started reading the list and, and going through it. How, do you, how did you originally get connected up with them? So um, every single one of them has their, their own story, 
But the typical path, and I'll tell a couple of the stories, but the typical path is they get hurt and they hear from a friend that the friend had success with an elliptico. And so then they'll uh, contact us or borrow their friends or somehow try one out and then figure out that, yeah, this is something that'll work for them. But we've had awesome just chance encounters with, you know, some of the best athletes in, in the world. Like Dean, we ran into him in a marathon before we even had a product and uh, he was giving a talk. And so we just went up to him after his talk and we're like, hey, Dean, we have a low impact run training substitute. He's like, no, you don't. We're like, yeah, no, we do. He's okay. like, if you have, literally, he said, if you have a low impact run training substitute, I want to see it. And so like a week later, I was riding an elliptico with Dean up at his house in Ross, California. And he's like, we finished this ride. He's like, this thing's amazing. How do I get one? Um, Meb, we ran into Meb at the, uh, we got lucky enough to get into the athletes, um, clothing distribution for the 2012 Olympics up in Eugene. After they'd qualified, there's like a big room they go through where they get sized for all their clothes for the trip. And so Meb happened to be in the room when we were like doing a tour of it. And so we just started chatting with them and he hadn't heard of the elliptico. This was 2012, but he showed us these pictures of his foot after the 2011 New York City Marathon, where he had sliced his foot up because he put one of his Breathe Right strips, he left it in his sock, and he couldn't run between November, whenever that race was in November, November 5th, call it, until the Houston Marathon um, for the qualifier that year. And he went out and he won the Olympic trials qualifier. And he didn't run in between those two things. He just biked. And so we were telling him, well, like, well, we have a bike that's like specifically for runners. And he's like, what? How do I not know about this thing? And so after the Olympics, he came, to, he lives in San Diego, we're in San Diego, and we met up and took him for a ride. And he's like, oh my gosh, where have you guys been? And so he started training on it in 2012. And then of course, you know how well he's done um, even since turning 40. But uh, yeah, it's just, you know, Jared found out about it through Meb. We ran into Neely Spence at the Olympic trials and she was doing test rides on it. You know, um, there's just, it's been fun. And and a lot of the athletes just reach, they find us actually. So it's been a neat, neat way to really get to know some amazing people that are in the sport of running. I I don't think, uh, we weren't contacted. (laughs) (laughs) Well, like I said, a lot of the elites contact us. Oh, okay. That's how it works. You guys to contact us. Okay. (laughs) You need your agent to reach out for you. Though, oh, exactly. Now I got to get an agent. Thanks. We do like, <laughs> so Shad, Shaddy b uh Shadrick b he was the number four finisher at Boston this year. Um, his agent reached out to us because his agent is Josh Cox. And Josh had used one when he was uh, training. He was trying to break the world record in the in the 50K. And so he's using elliptico a lot. And then Shadrick's been using it, according to Josh, every day. So Shadrick does an elliptico ride every day um, as part of his just fundamental training. All right. So let me ask you, what, um, who would be, it's not already using the elliptico, who would be your dream athlete to see on the elliptico? Gosh, uh, that's a great question. One I have not really considered. Um, I mean, Meb obviously is a huge, Meb, you know, Meb is super exciting for us. Dean is super exciting for us. Shaquille O'Neal has one. That was like the dream for our director of operations, who's had a Shaquille O'Neal poster on her wall since she was in middle school. Um, who is my dream athlete? I've always been a big fan of Michael Jordan, so that would be cool. But in within running, um, you know, Meb is personally just, I think, if not the best ambassador for that sport, certainly a fantastic human being and somebody I'm proud now to know. Now, I have to ask for Shaquille O'Neal, is that a custom build? No. That was my exact question, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you better send me the 40-foot section of tube. <laughs> we had no idea. We literally had no idea that Shaquille O'Neal owned one. And then one day, we just start getting emails from like people we know throughout the company, not just me, but also other employees, just start getting emails of like, have you seen this video of Shaq on an elliptico? We're like, what? And so we click it, and it's a Facebook post by Shaq of him riding his elliptico 
he owns a gym in Atlanta and apparently he rides it to his gym. And so it was a video of him like riding it. It's like a minute long video of Shaq just riding an elliptico down the street in Atlanta that he decided to post on his Facebook and it, it, you know, it blew up, got a million views or whatever. And, uh, yeah, that was a uh, marketing gift from the gods. I think (laughs) it's cool. You know, it's cool. Like that, um, Usher actually ended up doing the same thing, sort of a different guy than Shaq, but also lives in Atlanta. So there's something about Atlanta that people like to video themselves riding elliptigos. I know um, you were at um, Boston this year. You were talking about it a moment ago. And I didn't realize kind of some of the events that you were involved around the Boston Marathon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's a great question. We did a a, a ride, a group ride. So we have customers, you know, we have 20,000 elliptigos out on the road now. So we've got customers everywhere. And, and typically we'll go organize a uh, an event with those customers. Um, we've done sort of competitive races in the past. This year, we just did a ride um, along the Charles River, which was super nice. It was on the perfect day. It was a gorgeous day when we did the ride. I think it was hot for runners, but it was nice for us. So that was really, and then we had a meetup afterwards um, at a pub. So that was, Boston was sort of mellow this year uh, in that regard. But I think there was also a group too, wasn't there, that did the um, bike ride, the the midnight marathon too? Oh, yeah, 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 the yeah, 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 shoot. Yes. So I missed that because I flew home on Sunday. So it totally slipped my mind. Thank you. Yeah. So um, historically, on the morning of Boston, we would go ride the course. So we'd leave from Boylston Street, ride the course backwards out to um, Hopkinton, and then back to Boylston along the course. And then um, that was no longer viable after 2013. So there's a midnight ride. So people either ride out and back, just like I described, or they take a train out and then ride back. And so, yeah, there was a core of elliptigo riders um, out there in the middle of the night riding the course um, with a bunch of cyclists. So that's a, a known cycling event, too. So, um, yeah, thank you for reminding me. I totally forgot about that. No, that's well, it was the first time that I'd ever heard of it when I was reading about it. And that just sounds really cool. Other than I'm, you know, terrified to ride my bike outside and in the dark and all of that. But other than that, it sounds awesome. Well, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm glad you asked that question, Crystal, because I was reading your notes going, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have a new marathon at midnight. You didn't know about that one. No. <laughs> I also yeah, heard though at cool the meetup ride. afterwards when you guys were in the pub that uh was it Dean showed up to it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Dean and I had been trying to get together um while just while I was in Boston and he was in Boston. And it turned out the only time we could do it, he was actually planning on coming on the ride, but then he got caught up with some media stuff and so he couldn't join the ride. And so yeah, he ran over and hung out with the group uh at the pub, which was fun. Uh and it was also where um I've been remiss in reading his book about um the Spart- uh, the the run in and from the spark the original marathon um in Greece that was um is actually much different from how I had ever known it was with uh I'm gonna screw up his name, but Phidippides, who ran in like a four day period, the guy ran like almost three hundred miles and then died. And Dean's book on that is really well researched and super interesting if you're at all curious about the true origin of the marathon it's a it's a pretty good um investigation into it and and dean of course basically follows the guy's footsteps over in greece to uh, appreciate how hard of a of achievement that was have you read that one crystal i'm about halfway through it okay thanks. oh cool so you know i'm, exactly I'm about I'm halfway about. through several books. yeah brian, brian okay. in case you haven't noticed it is, it is great in case you haven't noticed crystal's got a little thing for dean oh <laughs> well i could <laughs> I could arrange an introduction. <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> uh, but the book's called The uh, Road to Sparta. I think the name. That's it. And, yeah, uh, I was trying to think yeah, what it was called too. I it's think. good. Now you have you have teamed up with Greg McMillan to write training plans. Yeah, so we met Greg. Gosh, years ago, um, and he was really energized about the idea, and so he came up. So we've had several, actually, several coaches have written. Um, training plans for it. Uh, Galloway, Jeff Galloway, um, Greg McMillan, um, Darren Brown, who coaches his wife, Sarah, who's a a, a professional 1500 meter runner. Um, Jenny, um, Jenny Hadfield. I don't know if you guys know Jenny. 
but uh, she was one of the very first coaches that really took to the elliptico. She did our second, I think, international ride where she crossed the border. She rode from Chicago to Toronto. Um, it's like 500 miles. And uh, but we've had so yeah. So Greg has written um, a series of training plans. Um, as ha- and there's other. He's sort of on the more elite side. Jenny's on more the recreational side. Um, as is Jeff Galloway. And so we we have training programs galore. So they'll, they'll actually factor in, like, I want you to run on Monday and then use your lip to go on Tuesday. And yes, that type exactly. Of stuff. Okay. Exactly. All right. Exactly. And do they do yeah. that through a website or you emailed or? You know, candidly, I am not sure where it is on our website. It's probably under the community section. There's probably a link for training. Um, but if you email info at Elliptigo, um, yeah, we can provide any of those, any of those training programs. I guess you could, there's also a search function on our website. I'm a little embarrassed that I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, if you just search training plans or, or Greg McMillan, those plans should come up. Uh, no worries. Crystal doesn't work on our website and I don't know where anything is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. It changed. Like I built the original one back in 2009. I knew everything about that one and since then. It's like, you know, I have a hard enough time keeping up with my phone. <laughs> How many employees are you guys up to now? Uh, 22 today. Wow. That's awesome. Mm, yeah. That's really yeah. good. Yeah, so I'm curious because well. you, know, you talk about some of the reactions and, and that you get. And I've seen some, you know, some of the comments that were on um, Dean's post and some of the other things. But I'm curious, what are some of the qu- craziest questions or comments that you've ever received? The craziest ones. The most consistent ones that boggle our mind are, can you coast? For some reason, people assume because it doesn't look exactly like a bike that there's, you can't coast on it. Does it climb hills? Get that all the time. Climbing is the best thing it does. And if you think about it, it's basically just, it's a lot like riding a bike standing up out of the saddle, which is something you do when you climb hills typically, or go over like, you know, rocky terrain or whatever. And then we've just changed the pedaling motion to be more like running. Um, So we get that question. What are the other crazy questions we get about it? How about how terrifying is it to go down the hill? It's great. It's actually, it, it's, <laughs> it. I'm a feels, chicken when it comes to that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So it, it feels more stable than a bike because the wheelbase is really long and you can't get going that fast because you have a bunch of air resistance. So the real kicker on it and why it's such a good workout is you're going through the world like a runner. So you're standing totally upright. You're not hunched over at all. And so you have about 55% more surface area than a, than a road biker does. Drag is the biggest factor on any item going through, you know, moving it at speeds above 12 miles an hour. Drag is by far the biggest issue that any object is, is working against. And so for us, we've got 55% more surface area. So we've got 55% more drag. And Drag actually is to the third power. So if you double your speed, your the effect of drag goes up by a factor of eight. So it's really hard to go fast. Like to get 20 miles an hour is pretty doable, but anything above that is really hard. And so on a descent, where on a bike, you might be going 40 miles an hour. On elliptical, you're probably doing like 26. So it's it's a much calmer sort of, descending the hill experience than it is, especially on a triathlon bike. I don't know if either of you guys are triathletes, but triathlon bikes are notoriously short wheelbases and are very skittish above like 40, 45 miles an hour. Um, and so the elliptico is the exact opposite. It's the opposite of a tri bike. The tri bike's all about being arrow. The elliptico is all about being comfortable. Uh, and you just, the trade off there is a tri bike has a really good coefficient of um, aerodynamic coefficient. And the elliptico is a really bad aerodynamic coefficient. But that means you only need to ride the elliptico for like 40 minutes to get in the workout. You get in in like an hour and a half on a tri bike. Yeah, I uh, I haven't gotten up the courage to do a triathlon and Andy okay. refuses to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to. I love the idea of doing one, but I just don't want to get wet. <laughs> we'll get you a dry get suit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <There> you <laughs> and you've done one, haven't you, Crystal? No, you know what? I have not. I've always, mm. I've always wanted to do one, and I've come really close a couple times. 
And um, this was going to be the year that I was going to do my triathlon. And then somebody talked me into going and running a hundred mile race and those plans went out the window. That's really stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Who would do that, right? Yeah. So let me ask you, Brian, let's pick your brain for a second. So if you have someone for me that's like curious about doing a triathlon and Crystal, what, I don't know, what's the question I'm looking for? What's the best way to start, I guess? Getting into triathlon? Mm -hmm. I I think that the, so the problem with triathlon is it's expensive to get a good bike. That's the fundamental problem with like sort of dipping your toes into triathlon. So when I got into it, I had a running background, run for, I don't know, nine, 10 years probably. before I started doing triathlon. So I bought a, a cheap bike and then did triathlons for about six months until I was convinced that I was actually going to continue with the sport. And then I went out and bought a nice bike. Um, and nice bikes back then cost like 2,500 bucks. Now they probably cost five grand. So it really is, it's a, there's a pricing problem with triathlon. But um, though I would say the best way to do it, if you can find a bike that you can borrow from somebody that's a decent triathlon bike. If you have any friends or triathletes that have an extra bike, because a lot of them do, um, if you can just borrow that for several months. And then the other thing you got to do is figure out your swim stroke and really get comfortable swimming in open water. Um, because w- what you'll find is learning to swim in a pool is not particularly helpful because a pool has a big black line on the bottom that sort of shows you which direction you should be going. They did not paint that same line on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> now, do you use like, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a certified scuba diver. So do you use like a, um, a dive compass when you're no, 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 no. It's interesting. So the swim stroke, you modify your swim stroke. At least the way I did it was I, I was every other or I was a every third stroke breather. So I'd breathe on my left side, every third stroke on my right side, three strokes after that, my left side, three strokes after that. And then on my uh, one, two, three, I guess my 12th stroke, I would actually, instead of just turning my head and breathing, I would actually lift my head out of the water and identify the target I was swimming towards. And then it'd be back in the water for three breaths. And then the fourth breath was out. And because the most important thing for your swim time is don't get lost. It's amazing how sometimes you'll be literally somebody on multiple races. I was swum across at a 90 degree angle. If somebody was literally swimming 90 orthogonal to the direction that they should have been swimming. And they weren't going to figure that out until they picked their head up and lifted it out of the water. Now, if you get into big races and you can swim fast enough, you can cheat by just staying literally on the toes of somebody who you think is a better swimmer than you. And then you can let them do all the sighting of the, what route you're on. But then you're, you know what I mean? Then you're sort of hooking your wagon to their star. If they get lost, you get lost. Um, But I'd say those were the two biggest techniques I learned over time. Andy, I might be in the same boat as you. I don't know if I want to get wet. <laughs> yeah, now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? I don't think 2018 is going to be the year either. <laughs> I, I love scuba diving, but uh, I can be down on the bottom with my compass and dive computer. And, you know. yeah. yeah, no compasses, no computers. And, if, and the, other, the only problem with the big races is it's for the first, I don't say 15 minutes probably, and that's not uh, an underestimate. It, it feels like you're swimming in a blender. There are so many legs and arms like around you that it's it's one of the more intense endurance sports experiences I've ever had. Wow. So do you think that's the hardest part, the swim or? No, it's funny. The the longer the race, the less relevant the swim is. So if you take an Ironman distance, uh, let's say world record guys or the the top guys will do it in, you know, eight hours ish. They'll be in the water for like 40 minutes and they'll be on the bike for you know, five hours or four, a little over four and a half hours, probably. And then they'll be on the run for two hours and 40 minutes. So it's the run determines the winner. The swim just determines the order of the start of the bike race. Okay. It's one way to think of it. I'm I'm trying to put this in in my time frame. So that's like a two hour swim, 12 hour (laughs) bike ride. Yeah. 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 And then a 240 marathon. That sounds pretty wow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and, and if i were to do anything like that i need the kids to get a little bit older because i imagine that once you go try your free time goes by yeah no it's a it's a part-time job recreational if you want to do long distance stuff as a recreational guy you're talking about 20 hours a week it's it's real it's a part-time job well we have some um 
Well, we have a few. I think we're going to throw a couple of these out, Crystal and Andy. We had some questions from our Facebook group, if you've got a few oh, minutes cool. to answer them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, sure. I think they were in a rare form. <laughs> <laughs> it. It, speaking of some um, crazy questions. Okay. <laughs> Krista, did you post this like Friday night or something? I don't know what people were doing when I posted this. but go, Why don't you go ahead and ask the first one, Crystal? So th- this is actually a good question. Mm-hmm. Um, so somebody who's a runner and who wants to transition into them, what's the best way to transition into them? Kind of suggestions for models for beginners um, and someone who's kind of just, just starting out. Yeah. The HC is the, is the right answer for almost everyone. It's um, our mid-level long stride product. Uh, it's specifically designed to emulate running. It's what Meb trains on. It's what Dean trains on. It's what Neely Spence trains on. We have 300 pro runners that train on them. Probably 295 of them train on the 8C. It's literally of that scale. So if you're a runner and you live anywhere outside of like Florida or a place that has zero hills, then the 8C is going to be the right fit for you. If you happen to live in a place with literally no hills, then you can get away with the 3C. Um, The only difference between the two products uh, is the uh, number of gears in the hub. So the 3C has three and the 8C has eight. And if you are in a place that that has some hills, you're going to want the eight-speed product. And if you're lucky enough to be in a place that has zero hills, you can get away with the three-speed product. But those are the those are the models I'd I'd recommend people to focus on. Okay, I'm going to ask this one because I'm the only single person on the Heartland Running podcast. <laughs> you hear me, ladies? <laughs> do you have? Any, I'm kind of paraphrasing this. Do you have any data on your product attracting the ladies? Uh, do I have any data on attracting the ladies? I have no. We've never done a study on it. I think what people say. So our average age of our consumers fifty. And we're pretty evenly split men and women. And I'd say the one thing that they comment on is that kids love them and they hadn't felt cool in so long that it's a trip to have like teenage kids, you know, driving next to them saying like, that bike's really cool. (laughs) And so they're like, oh, wow, that hasn't been said to me in 30 years. So uh, that's, I, I don't know how well it works with the you know, ladies that these people are trying to attract, but it definitely has a uh, positive resonance with, um, with the arbiters of cool who are usually children. Maybe you need to come up with like a uh, tandem model. So for like a date night model. (laughs) (laughs) See, but no, I had an answer for this and I said, I mean, look at Dean, it's working for Dean. It's, He's it's attracting the ladies on it, so, and it's clearly the elliptico that's doing it. It's clearly what. <laughs> it is not something that if you want to hide and like be unnoticed, it is not a, a, something that easily blends in to your surrounding environment. Mr. Andy, you want to read the next one? Yeah, I'll go ahead and read my question so it doesn't get kicked out. Uh, can I borrow one for testing and review and to make a video? <laughs> and it's okay to say no. <laughs> Um, but uh, so we, the good news is actually we do a 30 day, no questions asked return policy. So anybody who buys one has 30 days to figure out whether or not they like it. All their, um, sort of exposure is, is the, they got to get the bike back to us. So if you borrow one from us here at the office or not borrow, but if you buy one from us here at the office and bring it back, then you're out nothing after the 30 day period. If you have it shipped to you, then you have to cover the shipping back to us, which is 99 bucks. So you can basically rent one for, call it three weeks, figure out if you really like it. And if you don't, it's only going to cost you 99 bucks, um, which is less than we rent them to people for three days. So for some reason, <laughs> we haven't figured out why we're able to rent a bike to somebody for 100 bucks for three days, or I think it's, 100, it's either 100 or 150 bucks for a three-day rental, but they could have just bought it and then brought it back three days later and gotten it for free. But anyway, uh, mm-hmm. it is what it is. So that's a long way of saying, yes, you can borrow one for a month <laughs> and it only costs you a hundred bucks. I-, I thought you just ordered three. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> oh, I forgot to hit send. Um, how, how, how about some, uh, you know, kind of expanding on, on that seriously. Um, how, how would I go about finding a, uh, a dealer for those here in the Midwest? 
Yeah, so we've got a bunch of dealers in the Midwest. Um, we have a dealer locator on our website. It's something I do know about our website. On the upper right-hand corner, there's an, a space for, it says dealer locator. If you click on that, it takes you to a dealer locator screen. You put in your zip code or your city, and it'll pull up all the dealers that are near you. And then if for some reason you don't live near a dealer, we have about 260 dealers around the country. And if for some reason you don't live near one, you can always buy one directly from us. I think Fayetteville is about the closest for us, Andy. Okay, that's pretty close. Yeah, that's not bad at all. And I know here in the Cincinnati area, we have um, a bunch of them. And and a lot of those dealers will will let you come over and actually try them and and, um, go around the parking lots and stuff. And I think some of them will actually rent them as well, too, to try. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the dealer. Some have a rental program. Some just let you do a parking lot test ride. But they all should let you touch the product and ride it. And if they don't, please let us know because that's part of the deal of being a dealer is they need to let people experience the product. That's great. And where can people go to find out more information? Uh, Our website's the the place. It's elliptigo.com, E-L-L-I-P-T-I-G-O.com. And social outlets, Facebook, Instagram. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're on Facebook. Uh, We do have an Instagram account. Uh, We have a Twitter account. And actually, another place that's really neat to go to learn about Elliptigo is the private group page that our customers set up. So our customers, we have 20,000 of them and they're super active. So one of them set up a Elliptigo group page that now has over 2,000 members and they discuss everything Elliptigo. So it's a group. It's not our company. Our company has a page, but this is like a private group where it's almost like a message board. They're talking about different rides they do and accessories they have and their favorite, you know, GPS tracker and stuff like that. So so you have your own version of the Hells Angels? Exactly. (laughs) No, really. They set it up. They set it up last fall. Our customers set up the Global Elliptigo Riders Club, and it's got over 100 members. I think it's like 140 right now or 150. And they put on events. So they put on an event in Arizona. Uh, They have an event June 2nd in Cape Cod. They're planning one for New York City later this year. And yeah, people pay 50 bucks. They become part of the me- this membership club and they have their own shirts and the whole nine yards. Got to earn that patch. Got to earn the patch. <laughs> oh, and, then, and actually they run a contest. They, they run these challenges for if you can climb. So they just had a guy do what's called Everesting. So you guys will appreciate this if you're ultra marathoners. So he, in total time of 18 hours, climbed 30,000 feet. Wow. So 18 hours, he climbed 30,000 feet. It was 15 hours of ride time, three hours of eating food probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's called Everesting. It's like a thing for cyclists. There's a group um, called the Hells 500 is the name of the group. They have the official rules for Everesting and they, and they track everyone who Everests. So now the club is running this contest to see if normal people can Everest in a month. So to do what this guy did in one day, but spread it out over a month, which is actually pretty legit still. It's over a thousand feet of gain a day, uh, or it's quite a bit. It's just about a thousand. I think it's four weeks. So it's like just over a thousand feet of gain every day. So if you don't ride one day, you got to do 2000 the next day. So it's pretty serious. Wow. That, that's a lot of elevation. Yeah. No, even, thank you. <laughs> even for me around here. <laughs> well, Brian, you know, you have a, um, you have an honor today because when, th- when this episode comes out, this will be the last episode before the entire Heartland crew joins forces at the Run Under the Stars in Paducah, Kentucky. Oh, cool. So we're all going to go out and run 10 hours around a half mile horse track. Why? <laughs> it sounds awful. For the same I reason. Go. <laughs> what are you guys thinking? Andy, you have to go. I bribed your wife. I know. <laughs> and you're the chef. You, yeah, you you're want the my chef. wife flowers. Yep. To to get so so that way she'd let me go on this trip. <laughs> and so so my my twelve year old son he comes up to me and he says, "Dad, is he hitting on her?" <laughs> no, son. Oh, you don't know how bad it was. I was I was sitting at the flower website or whatever, and I'm like, "What kind of flowers do you send your your good friend's wife?" <laughs> 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 I'm like, "Okay, roses are definitely out." <laughs> yeah. And then it was it was for Mother's Day. I'm like. Well, I don't want to send something too nice in case he sent something junky. <laughs> if he stopped by the cemetery or something. 
<laughs> gas station flowers. Gas station flowers. I didn't flowers. have to get her flowers. Steven already got her flowers. <laughs> You're welcome. She her car. She was happy. <laughs> you are welcome. But anyways, we are hoping to see a ton of our listeners out there at Ruts as we go round and round and round and round and round. <laughs> I'm I'm predicting uh, I'm going for 42 miles. 42 miles in 10 hours 42. on a horse track. On a horse track. What, what's what's your goal there, Crystal? 43. 43. All right, Andy. <laughs> uh, 10k. I'll be barbecuing. 10k. You'll be barbecuing. You're the smart one. <laughs> Anyways, Brian, we want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It was very educational for me. Well, I appreciate it. I really do. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, you guys have a fun gig going on here, and uh, I was thrilled to be a part of it. And we will have links in the show notes to your website and social outlets, and we hope you will return uh, once we all get down and can go out on some test rides. And well, after Andy buys them and sends them to us, too. Yes. So. That's the right path. I'll, I'll get right on that. All right. Andy, you got anything to add before we close? I'm good. Thank you very much for coming. Miss Crystal? All right. No, I'm good. But thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate having you uh, having you come on tonight. All right. Oh, that was fun. All right. Sounds good. Well, until next time, everyone, we want to thank you for sticking us in your ears. And I'm Steven. And I'm, I'm Crystal. Andy. <laughs> See? Oh. oh, you guys are just off tonight. We'll <laughs> fix it. And, we'll fix it in post. No, I won't. All right, everyone. Talk to you later. Lord, I made it to the station with my suit.